And I think that, that that's where our strength lies is when we create collectives across different um, uh, lines and across different areas because the, the issue is so complex that unless we have a very um, interconnected approach, uh, we're going to, to be in trouble. Um, an enormous thank you to you and also to the AAPG, to Jim, um, to Portia, to Andy. Um, I think also, again, the AAPG has been so active in emphasizing the idea that this is not one political party's agenda, that unless there is a complementarity, it's almost like the Women's Caucus and its work across the decades, unless there's a complementarity and um, uh, genuine conversations about where the convergence lies in the agendas across different political parties, then again, we're going to be in trouble. Um, an enormous thank you to the FCDO, in particular, Mike Babcock, who started with us the journey at the beginning, and of course, um, uh, Stuart Rosen, who's our current uh, counterpart. But also, um, uh, Claire and, and Mariam and, and Jafar and our dear Sayyid Yusuf al Khoi, who's too unwell to be with us, um, and others, they are the founders of Crete because it's a collective of partners across many co countries and the governance is a governance of partners where the sum of all the different parts of faith-based organizations as well as human rights organizations and development organizations on the ground um, make it happen. And I want to start by just some figures, but then I want to become the devil's advocate and tear apart Crete as an approach. Um, if, if there are people standing there critiquing the work across four years, you know, putting us on, the, uh, on an examination uh, seat and saying, this is rubbish, what would they say? And, 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 what, and, and where, are we, where have we fallen short, actually? And what have we learned from our failings um, as a program? But first, I'll just share a number of um, very quick numbers just to get the big picture, because we've heard a little bit about insights on Myanmar, Iraq, and Pakistan, and where, how does this all sit together now? So um, we have about 92,504, uh, so, so uh, sort of sent, don't forget the four, uh, <laughs> people who have directly uh, interacted with our program, directly benefited from our program. Um, and then about between 1 million and 2 million indirect um, collaborators or counterparts. These are people who have reached through messages on television or social media and who have interacted through those kind of engagements as opposed to directly benefiting, but it's an indirect benefiting of the program. What we work through is something called action research, which is that we empower local communities to do their own research on their work because parachuting in researchers from the UK doesn't have the legitimacy and doesn't establish the kind of the nuance and what's going on. Um, so we, we build capacity locally so that local partners can benefit from the research because they're the ones that are doing it, but also they're the ones that are documenting what's happening on the ground day by day. So that's the, the, the research bit. The action bit is that they are the ones that are implementing the programs. They're the ones that um, are thinking about the backlash, the, the, the countermeasures that they may experience when um, they engage in the community. They're the ones that have to think of the, all the unintended outcomes and plan it into their interventions. Um, during the program, we have uh, uh, sought, we, well, we've implemented or 314 training programs attended by thousands of people. We've published 16 working papers, of which uh, some Fiona mentioned. These are all open access on our website because we don't believe knowledge should be restricted to those that have access to libraries and universities or, and so forth. So these are all open access. I think for us, what was really important was creating platforms for people in Myanmar or Pakistan or Iraq um, to actually write their own stories and then it takes us a bit of time to sometimes translate it and, and to make sure that safety considerations are in place. But we've had voices of people from across these countries that have been published in 491 blogs, podcasts, and other outputs where people on the ground are telling their stories and we're creating platforms for them either here or in country um, through um, also local languages so that things are not just for our own consumption but are things are being digested and engaged with in countries. 
We have one book out, which you will uh, see, The What About Us, which again is an open access book. And we have three more coming out uh, soon. They're just being peer reviewed and that kind of thing. So let me start by saying, well, what are the, the, the sort of the, the counter arguments about this program? And I think one of them, which we received in our first year is, there's bits here, bits there. There's a project here, a project there, 51 action research groups. But what does this all add to? Is there a big picture here? Does it all add to something, a big idea? Couldn't this all be scattered and therefore of no effect because it's so tiny? It's so, he, and, and, I, and I take that point. I think we did purposely design this so that um, it is off the radar. So it is not all invested in one country, in one project, such that um, cloud down happens and um, we have to stop the entire program because we are working in countries where there's a great deal of repression. Um, and the second thing, which for us is the essence of it, which is none of us, not IDS, not Minority Rights Group, not El Ho'i, not Rif Semi, none of us separately have a monopoly on legitimacy. We are dealing here with minorities who can be Muslim, who can be Christian, who can be Buddhist, who can be Kakayi, who can be Sabian Mandian, who can be Yazidi, who can be of no faith, who can, and so forth. And we need multiple legitimacies. We need people where, where, who are positioned such that they can speak to um, the trust concerns of different groups without having to feel that one of them is not really representing them. And I think that's where the multiple legitimacies is so important. For us, that was from a point of <coughs> recognizing none of us. There is no one legitimacy root or representative. We need multiple legitimacies because people are of faith and no faith in different ways. The second um, uh, critique, if you like, or devil's advocate argument is, well, surely if the entire Sabian Mandian community is persecuted or the entire Yazidi community is persecuted, why are you focused on the poor? Why are you focused on that particular class? And it is a very class-based approach that we specifically said we will start working with the poor, but not stop there. We need to take it up to the policy level, as Mariam showed and Claire showed. And that, for us, was critical. It's those intersecting inequalities that, for us, are critical in the legitimacy issue. It is about the fact that if you are poor, you are likely to have less access to clean water, less access to decent housing, less access to decent employment, and less access to, um, well, uh, let me put it bluntly, uh, transport that is sexual harassment free. Um, so it is about those intersections. That's where we need to start. We need to start with those that are living on the margins. We can't stop there, but we need to start there. And that's important because that's where the agenda setting starts. We refused to start with agenda setting among the elites. We said we will set our agenda as a program from the bottom and take it up, but it has to be among those because these are the ones that are experiencing most intersecting inequalities. But then there is a counter argument from the development community. The de those that work in international development may come back and say, been there, done that. If you start by working with among the poorest of the poor, then by default, you will get to those religiously marginalized. Why focus on the religiously marginalized? We have women who are marginalized. We have the disabled who are marginalized. We have those that are um, uh, well, other than disability and gender, we have all varieties of people who are extremely socioeconomic excluded, including the unemployed youth. Why are we assuming that we need to zoom in on those intersections? Surely, if we have development aid that is reaching or that is designed to reach those that are most acutely experiencing poverty, then by default, religiously marginalized people will, will be reached. And unfortunately, that is one of the key findings of this program, that it doesn't work this way, that religiously marginalized people are a blind spot, even in, a, even in international development aid that yeah. seeks to be most inclusive, that seeks to be most intersectional in its approach. Why? Well, we've discovered there's lots of reasons, but one of them is prejudice. They get to be overlooked. Another is legitimacy. 
they don't know how to reach to those that are religiously marginalized because they don't have trust in those communities who are extremely suspicious of outsiders, as Claire said, because of their experiences. Third is because they don't actively seek to include them. We've learned this lesson from making development uh, sensitive to women's uh, empowerment, that unless you actually purposely seek to make development sensitive to women's empowerment, it won't automatically happen. And the same thing here. It does not automatically happen. And we have ended up with humanitarian interventions that are not able to reach those that are marginalized. And, and, and that's, that's heartbreaking. So I think these, where, where are we pushing with this? Well, first of all, um, in order for us to push forward and continue the work of the sum of all the wonderful parts around this room, the, the civil society organizations, the, the great leadership on the part of Fiona, the great issue on the part of AEPG, the media and everyone else, we need to reinstate a commitment to 0.7% of aid going to uh, the global south. We cannot direct aid internally and say this is supporting for. It has to be supporting issues here, but also reinstate. It was this great country that came up with a 0.7% of GNI. From, from, this, from here, that this principle was, um, became a, a leadership to the rest of the world that we need that moral and financial commitment. Just as the UK led on through Hans Singer, Sir Hans Singer, he was the one that incited, that led on this principle, now we need to re, regain our leadership by, by, by putting in the 0.7% GNI. The second thing is that we need to empower champions within the government across different departments and teams um, to, to, to make religious or intersecting inequalities an agenda across all parts of the government, be it, um, be it, uh, the, uh, be it the, uh, the, the, the parts that work on gender, the parts that work on governance, the parts that work on, on conflict, across the board. We need that more interconnected approach by empowering those within the government. I know I've, I've got, I've, I have gotten the look, so I better stop. But I think I'll stop there um, and, 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 and say, in this program, we've only scratched the surface. We'd be very happy to share with you things that we have failed in, in this program, from which we've also learned. It's been a, also a, an area where things have not always worked out. We'd be very happy to openly and honestly share with you some of those. Um, but thank you so much for coming here to support us. And um, I think for us, it's about an accompanied journey. Now the journeying starts in, a, in the next season with all of us working together. Thank you.